I would describe it as a life built on incredible experiences that represent incredible determination and persistence. Jean Ballard came out of poverty in the Deep South with barely a second grade education and rose to the highest levels of a number of different experiences and um, talents throughout his whole life that uh, made Tom and I think that in the beginning that this was really 10 guys and not just one guy. I was researching another book on World War I and one chapter in the book was going to be about famous American aviators. I opened up a text and I think, if I remember correctly, I was researching some information on the most famous American flyer of that war, Eddie Rickenbacker. And down in a footnote buried at the bottom of the page was this mention of a fellow by the name of Gene Ballard who happened to be the first black fighter pilot in history who volunteered to fly for the Americans, but through a series of bits of blatant racism, was turned down and never got the chance. As historians, we felt like this was a story that could no longer go untold. Uh, we were kind of surprised, and uh, but when we both became more familiar with the story, it was startling that uh, Eugene Ballard died in 1961, and yet, so we're talking about you know, 50 something years later, and there had been, for at least a mainstream audience, uh, this most remarkable story uh, about what we think is one of the most fascinating characters of the 20th century had not been told. Well, Gene Blore was a was a practical man, and he got out of the military in 1919. The war had been over the, since the previous year. Went back to Paris, and at that time there was not a great demand for fighter pilots, black, black or otherwise. So uh, he needed to find a job, and it was a time when nightclubs were opening left and right. You started with the war over. You had people coming over from the United States to sample the uh, the, the culture and excitement that was Paris in the 1920s. So he learned how to play the drums, and he would play in a band at a place called Zelly's, where he also was a manager there. And uh, as the years went by, more people got to know him, not, not just as a musician, but as a, uh, as a manager, as a host. Uh, he ended up having his own club, uh, Lesca Drill, that, that, uh, that he opened up. By the time he had done that, people wanted to come to his club to see him, first of all, because he was a charismatic figure, but also the atmosphere, you know, the champagne was flowing and there was musical entertainment. Uh, he would have people like Bricktop uh, and other musicians and singers uh, come play at his club. And uh, he became one of the top uh, um, empresarios in the jazz scene in Paris. Anyone who was, anyone who came to Paris or actually lived in Paris at the time uh, ended up at one time or another at La Cadrille. Now, the French police, knew this, and when the uh, Nazis in particular began infiltrating Paris in the mid to late 1930s, they, like many other uh, German nationals or others from around Europe, ended up at Jean's club. And one day, an inspector from the Paris Police Department came to Jean and asked him if he might consider doing a little work for them. And Gene said, well, what do you have in mind? He said, well, in addition to being an inspector for the police, I'm also a member of the Deuxième Bureau. And the inspector said, so many of these folks that we're interested in end up at your club. If you happen to overhear them say something you think might be of interest to us, would you be willing to pass it along? And Gene, who was a fervent Francophile and uh, a, a true hater of, of Nazis, and of course he'd had the experience fighting the Germans in World War I, readily agreed. So that began Gene's career as a, a spy prior to World War II, and he did it, and did it very well for several years. While he poured the champagne and pretended not to speak a word of German, he spoke German fluently and picked up a lot of valuable information. 
Yeah, the Eugene Ballard story is something like uh, the, if, if the New York Post page six was covering the American history of the you know early and middle part of the 20th century. When he got over to Europe, he, uh, as a member of the military in World War I, there were a number of people who were pilots, who were soldiers, that uh, uh, he was part of the same unit, so they crossed paths. Uh, you know, Eddie Rickenbacker is one, uh, uh, Kermit uh, Roosevelt, who was uh, one of Theodore Roosevelt's uh, sons. Because he was a charismatic man and his clubs were lots of fun, uh, that was the Grand Duck and, and Les Cadrille were places that people went to go to. So it would not be unusual that uh, any given night uh, you'd have somebody like the composer uh, Cole Porter in the audience or F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and his wife sometimes appeared there. Uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, was a patron of the clubs. In fact, if you read uh, his, Hemingway's first full-length novel, uh, The Sun Also Rises, there is a character uh, who, who is a, a black drummer uh, that's based on Eugene Ballard in that novel. Fred Astaire and his sister uh, were, were uh, people who came there. Right through the end of, of Ballard's life, it's, it's uh, one person after another are these bold-faced names, and he just seemed to glide through history and encounter these people, and, and they found him fascinating. When I began to pull this story apart and then put the pieces back together, I realized this was a tremendous story we had on our hands. I think for a central lesson, it's it's one of, of perseverance and resiliency, and, and just don't give up. If you have a dream, keep going after it. Mm -hmm.